till the 12th verse of the first chapter it goes like this atma sakshi vibhu purnah eko mukta stidakriya asang nispriha shanto bhramat samsar vani va what does that mean atma you see what is vedanta about atma means the self even when you say the self it still sounds pretty philosophical and abstract it means you it literally means you you know in, in indian languages the word atma has got other meanings um some people think atma means the the departed ones the ghosts or something like that no it just means you your own self right now what you are vedanta is about yourself vedanta is not really about god vedanta is not about how this universe was created these things are discussed but only secondarily so it's not about how this universe was created it's not even about god it's not even about karma not even about heaven and how to go to heaven no vedanta is centrally about you atma about yourself why should that be interesting well first of all why shouldn't it be what's the most in- interesting subject we have in the world ourselves we ourselves <laughs> so if, if it's something is entirely about you you would be interested in it but more than that deeper than that vedanta says that all the purpose in life whatever you're trying to do in secular life in your jobs in your relationships in your day to day life that happiness which you are seeking that satisfaction and peace that you are seeking we are all seeking that and mostly ineffectually i mean all of us sitting here today if you honestly look back upon our life from the earliest childhood till today what else have been we trying to do except trying to be happy trying to get some happiness trying to avoid misery overcome suffering that's what we have been trying to do and who amongst us somebody here is maybe 10 years old somebody might be 90 years old who amongst us can claim honestly to oneself that i have succeeded i have found it i am perfectly at peace i have uh, no no sufferings in the world who can actually claim that vedanta is about that and vedanta makes the claim that if you knew yourself as you truly are you would find that peace that satisfaction you would transcend suffering vivekanand in this country when he came here to this country he would sometimes remark with with a touch of pathos he would say if only you knew your knew yourself as you truly are if only you knew yourself as you truly are meaning thereby all our suffering would be overcome what you want in life you would get it if you knew yourself as you truly are it also means by implication we do not know ourselves as we truly are what we think about ourselves our first reaction is it's about me well i i know about myself i am sort of an authority on myself after all who else is an authority on me not your vedanta i am an authority about myself vedanta says you are wrong you really do not know anything much about yourself and what you know about yourself is wrong not only wrong it's the source of all your troubles mark twain i love this quote from mark twain he said it's not what we do not know that gets us into trouble it's what we know that it just ain't so <laughs> i am brahman i am one with god no it just ain't so i'm just this guy vedanta says no that's where where you are wrong vedanta is about atma one interesting idea about the atma is that which literally it comes from atti to eat to eat to eat here means not literally to eat it means to experience uh, we experience we eat actually with our eyes with our ears with our tongue of course with our sense of touch and smell with our five sense organs we are eating that means all the inputs that pour into us that which experiences eats the world of form and sound and taste and smell and touch that is atma and that's only in the waking stage right now when you go to sleep and you dream you you see people and things and things happen to you 
uh, good dreams and nightmares and things like that. There also you are eating uh, the subtle forms, not, not with your sense organs, but in your mind. All the images and things, the dreams generated in your mind. That's also an experience. You're still experiencing, but with the mind only, not with the physical senses. And then when we sleep, when we slip into deep sleep, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, when we slip into deep sleep, blankness. There also you are eating, in one, the, uh, the Upanishadic word is Ananda Bhuk. You experience, you, you let us say, eat, experience the peace and the quietness and the blankness, the absence. Uh, deep sleep is not an absence of experience. It's an experience of absence. Uh, so there also, that which eats in the waking state, through this body and through the five senses right now, in the dream state, in your mind, and in deep sleep, in that blankness and restfulness, the one continuous thing, that is the Atma. Atma. Sri Ramakrishna, some people say, you know, all this Vedanta you're teaching, but Sri Ramakrishna taught a simple religion of bhakti, of love, of God. True. There is a collection of Sri Ramakrishna's sayings. Um, I always carry it in my, yeah, I've got it, thank God, in my pocket. Wherever I go, I take it. This is the sayings of Sri Ramakrishna. It's the only book that Swami Brahmananda ever wrote. I think it's translated into English as words of the master, a small book. So it's a, just the choicest sayings of Sri Ramakrishna collected by Swami Brahmananda. And the simple devotee of Kali, the lover of God. You know what's the first saying in this book? The very first one. I'll read out the first sentence in Beng Bengali and then translate. First saying in this book. Manush apna ke chinte parle, Bhagavan ke chinte parle. When a, a, a human being, a person, when this person knows himself or herself, that person knows God. When you know yourself, you know God. This is Sri Ramakrishna. Atma, the self. If you would know yourself as you truly are, you realize God. You go beyond suffering. You attain permanent bliss. So, so important to know the self. Now, our first reaction is, I know myself, who am I? I'm this person, this body, this mind. The next word, Atma, Sakshi, Vibhu, Purna, Sakshi. The next word. What is the self? Is it this bundle of flesh and blood? Is it the person in this body? The mind, the intellect, the memories, the likes and dislikes, the knowledge. The person I think I am. Is, is that the self? Or is it something beyond that? According to Vedanta, you are, the, the real self is the witness consciousness. It is that which experiences. I said which experiences in the waking state, in the dream state, in the deep sleep state. The one unchanging experiencer, which enables all experience. What does that mean? Take a simple, simple methodology. Uh, it's a philosophical inquiry into who am I. A technique. Remember, there are many such techniques in Vedanta. They are called prakriya techniques and methodologies. Take one. This, this te technique is called the technique of the seer and the seen. Drig drishya viveka. A simple technique. What does it say? Remember, the purpose is to discover Atma, the real self. Ken Wilbur has written a book, The Atman Project. The Atman Project, it's about discovering who we really are. What does this method say? It says this, follow this carefully. It says, you are that which experience says. That which is experienced is not you. I'll repeat that. It's pretty simple. Anything that you experience, it's not you, not the real self, not Atma. 
That which experiences is the Atma. What you see is not yourself. The one who sees is you. Drik Drishya literally means the seer and the seen. Differentiating the seer and the seen. Do you see it? Yes, then it's not you. Did you experience it? Yes, then it's not the Atma. It is something that the Atma experienced. Simple, a simple operating procedure. Simple uh, methodology. But it will have tremendous implications when you actually use it. Let's use it. Take a look around yourself here. This room, the things that you see, you know it. Even without any Vedanta, you know it's not me. Clearly. We don't think, I don't think I'm this lectern or the microphone or even this cloth or even the shirt that I'm wearing. I don't think it's me. But the real problem for us starts with the body. Sometimes we say, we are this body. What's this? It's me. Who are you? This. So this body is me. I am this body. It starts with this. But let's use the method. What did the method say? That if you experience it, it's not you. If it's an object of your awareness, it's not you. Are you aware of the body? Yes. I can see the body. I can feel the body. I can touch the body. Sometimes, unfortunately, you can even smell the body. So, the body is definitely an object of my, an object of my experience. And using that, that methodology, that which you experience is not yourself, is not the self, not the Atma. If I experience the body, then the body is not the self. It's an object of experience. Okay, good. Let's look deeper. With what are you seeing the body? Here is the body. And what am I seeing the body with? With the eyes, which are also part of the body. Am, can I experience the eyes, the sensory system, the ears, eyes, tongue? And Do I experience that? True. We experience it. My eyes are open. Do I not experience it? My eyes are closed. I need glasses. I can't see too well. It's the eyes and its various conditions are experienced by me. If it's an object of experience, the eyes are an object of experience. In that case, I am not the sensory system either. The eyes and the same applies for the ears and the nose and the tongue and the sense of taste, taste touch. So I'm not the, experience, the, the, um, the sensory system as well. What experiences the sensory system? Clearly the mind. The mind is thinking about the eyes and the body. So am I the mind? And it, this is where most educated, sensitive, thinking people would stop. Yeah, I am the mind. I am this person. Thoughts, my thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories. This is what constitutes the person which I call myself. But do you experience that? Can you look inside and experience your own thoughts? Can we experience our feelings? Of course we can. In fact, feelings are directly experienced by us. I am happy. Do I experience happiness? You can, I can never say, we can never say that I am very happy, but I don't feel it. It sounds very, very strange. Yeah. I am miserable, but of course I don't feel a bit of it. No. Happiness, misery, pain, our sensations and emotions are directly experienced by us. If they are directly experienced by us, the constituents of our minds are directly experienced by us. In that case, the minds are also an object of experience for us. It's an object of experience for you. Are you with me so far? That to which the mind is an object of experience. See, this table is an object of experience to my eyes. My eyes and the body are an object of experience to my mind. And my mind is an object of experience. I cannot deny it. It's a, it's a fact. To what? That awareness which experiences the mind from within. That awareness which cannot be objectified. That is called, for want of a better term, because it witnesses, it shines upon, illumines every movement of the mind, every thought, every idea, every mem memory, every feeling. It's called the witness. In Sanskrit, Sakshi. Sakshad Ikshate which sees directly, which experiences directly. What does that mean? 
It is that witness consciousness with the, through the mind which experiences the body. It is the witness consciousness through the, through the mind and the sense organs which enables me to see you. The witness consciousness directly experiences the mind. But for us to experience the world, we need the instrumentation of the mind and the sense organs. Not directly. We do not experience the world directly through some, some instruments. You want to see bacteria, you need a microscope. You want to see the far stars, you need a powerful telescope through an instrument. But the witness consciousness directly illumines whatever is closest to it. So the mind is closest to the witness consciousness and the mind is directly illumined by the witness consciousness. Sakshi, which experiences, which shines directly upon our minds. You might say, well, I can sort of say, yeah, I think I know what you mean. I have a sakshi, a witness consciousness. Not that you have a sakshi, you are the witness consciousness. We often tend to, the mind plays a trick, you know, in order to pr preserve its primacy, its importance in the scheme of things. It tends to sidestep it. Yes, Swami, I understand what you are saying. The Atma, the Sakshi is very good, no problems. But I have some problems. You are the Sakshi, you are the witness consciousness. The witness consciousness, the Sakshi is not like my liver or my, or my uh, um, lungs. Or, no, it's me, the real me. It's you with the Sakshi, the, the, the Sakshi with the mind which is the person. You are not even the person. You are that within which is aware of the person. The very term Sakshi is very powerful. It shows you what liberation is, what enlightenment is, what freedom is. The person never gets freedom. That might sound shocking. The person never gets moksha or nirvana. You get freedom from the person. You, the witness consciousness, you realize you are free of the person. The person will continue. Who is the person? It's that, that ever-changing, that uh, continuously transforming set of ideas, likes and dislikes, memories, tendencies. Right now, the person, imagine, the person has changed so much from babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth to middle age to senior. So it changes so much. And yet, there is a light within which lights up this person. That light within is the Sakshi. Very precise way of isolating the Sakshi, of, of, of seeing what yourself for what you are. Use the same technique. That which I, am not, which I am aware of is not me. Aware of the body, then the body is not me. Aware of the mind, then the mind, which I think to be myself, that's also not me. In fact, in Vedanta, the mind is called a subtle body. The mind is also a body. Just like we have the feeling of being embodied. That I am in this body, embodied. Vedanta would say, you are also in the mind. I don't know, you, can, you cannot concoct a new term, en-minded or something. No. But basically, Vedanta would say, you are embodied in a physical body, a gross body. By gross, I don't mean the body is gross. It may be very fit and very nice. But... Physically, it's, it's a physical uh, body. And I'm also embodied in a subtle body. Mind, intellect, memory, ego. Very interesting. Ego. What is the ego? The one which says I. You say, I am sitting on the chair. Right now, if you say that, I am sitting on a chair. It seems to be a fact. But apply the same technique. Are you aware of this feeling of I am sitting on the chair? Which means that I, which you are aware of, that's also an object. That I, which you are, we are all aware of the I inside. I am speaking. Okay, this I. I am aware of it. In that case, that I is also an object. Are you with me? No? Just feel it. I, sitting on the chair. I. It's an object. A very subtle object, but still an object. That which is aware, which shines on the eye, on the, ob the very subtle object called the eye, that one is the sakshi, the witness. So the witness is something beyond the ego also. Not the body, not the mind. The illuminer of the body-mind and through the body-mind of the universe. 
that unchanging consciousness is called the Sakshi. Well, Swami, why did you say unchanging? I said unchanging because every change is illumined by that consciousness. If that consciousness were to change, if you are aware of that change, then the change becomes an object to that consciousness. It's not, that consciousness is not changing. It illumines a change. The change is an object different from that consciousness. By, by logic, by simple logic, you can see that the, that consciousness is unchanging. But remember, it's not an object. It's not a thing. If it were a thing, it would be separate from you. Sakshi. In fact, if you use this technique, whatever I am aware of, that I am not. That much. Then you see that you are not the body, you are not the senses, you are not the vital force, the breath, prana. You are not the mind, you are not the intellect. You can see, because you are all aware of all of them. You are aware of all of these. You are not. If you stop there, if you stop right there, you've got Buddhism. When Buddhism says, there is no permanent self, anatma. Often people say there's a great conflict between Hinduism and Buddhism and they've debated this for more than a thousand years. There's rich flowering of Indian philosophy for more than a thousand years of debate between the Hindu dualist schools and the various Buddhist schools. Hindus speak about an atma. Look at this, what we just read, atma. And the, the Buddhists say anatma, no self. But you know, when you look at it from a non-dualist perspective, it's virtually, you're saying virtually the same thing. One, they're coming at it from a negative side, one from a positive side. And there is merit on both sides. It's a digression, I know, but let, let me make this point. The advantage of the Buddhist point is that, I just said that the real self, the Sakshi is not a thing, not an object. If you listen to it the way, the way we speak about it in Vedanta, the way the Hindus speak about it, you get the feeling it's something. It's a thing. Something rarefied, something very subtle, but still a thing. If you take it from the Buddhist perspective, you see it's not a thing, not an object. That correction, that correction happens if you ground, your, if you take the Buddhist approach. It's not a thing. They are right. It's not a thing. Absolutely they are right. It's not a thing. It's not an object. But on the other hand, if you stick closely to the Buddhist approach, you get the feeling it's nothing. But it's not nothing either. The Buddhists themselves say that. Nagarjuna says, what's the highest? He, he says the ultimate truth, tattvam. The ultimate truth is shunyam, the void. What is the void? Is it something that exists? He says no. So it does not exist. No. It both exists and does not exist. No. It neither exists nor does not exist. No. Chatush koti vinir mukta tattvam. The shunyam, the void is something beyond the four alternatives. If you take the Buddhist approach, you realize it's not an object. But you, get, you run the danger of thinking it's nothing. But the Buddhists themselves say that shunyam, the void, is not nothing. Then the Hindu approach is useful. You say that it's not nothing. It's the witness of that so-called nothing. Often in spiritual life, you can end up with a vacuum, a void, a shunyam. And at that point, if you take this Vedantic approach, what is aware of this void? It's not another thing. It's something beyond all things, beyond all objects. So, Sakshi, the witness consciousness. Atma Sakshi Vibhu Purnaha Vibhu. And very interesting word.